Hello everybody. Hello everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Man Rides Bike and Talks to Camera. We're going to start here at this trail closure and nothing on this sign as far as I can tell says when it's going to be open again. There's some better signage here, Carmel. I think we should get riding, but we will start off with one Twitter question. So this comes from Ant Tifa, Antifa, okay, creative as the internet. Have you ever had to deal with people telling you that you shouldn't ride your bike for some reason? I'm a daily rider and have been told regularly not to ride my bike by coworkers that I don't know. I'm the new kid. It's too hot, not safe. Absolutely, Antifa. The best thing you can do is just ignore them. Um, a lot of these people, they don't know any different. They like to maintain the status quo of warnings and assumptions about how people should live and uh, do their transportation. If you do engage them about it, come back at them with positivity, successes in your ride, the things that it does for you, what you like, things that you do to enable yourself to make it easier and more enjoyable than, say, driving. It doesn't have to be a debate. Come at them with positivity and just some of your stories. That always beats data, I think. Just stories and experiences. And good luck to you. Keep it up. Don't stop. But be safe. Okay, City Hall's over there we just passed. I'm going to turn the camera so we can see some new housing going up here. Right along the Monon Trail. Look at that. The front door faces the trail. I can only hope that these people actually ride bikes or walk. Now, I don't think they're affordable, but... <laughs> And there's more going up here too. More apartments, more condos. Okay, so next we're coming up on uh, an area that's undergoing some revisions. And we're gonna take a look at the Carmel Christmas Market that's going up already. It opens in November. And if you ever wanna come to Carmel and check out the Christmas Market, uh, it's actually voted uh, one of the top five, top 10 in the whole United States. And I attended it for the first time last year and it's, it's really nice. Once they get all the buildings up and the lights up, it's, it's really amazing. I want to go in there and show you around, but I don't want to be a pain. A uh, future episode or a future quick ride, I'll just come over and show you around. So everything you see behind me is an infrastructure revision that's gone on all freaking year. <laughs> uh, but hopefully they'll be getting done with it here soon. Doing some real good fancy camera work here, Brandon. <sighs> Gonna have to stop and adjust my equipment. Does this have to be such a pain in the ass? All right, we're back. Hopefully we're level, not crooked. Let me show you this area here. This is a nasty strip mall that has been vacated and is going to be torn down and turned into uh, housing, commercial space, mixed use development, and I'm sure the trail here. Okay, this mother Oh my God. Problem after problem today. <sighs> All right, we're back again. My tripod is slightly broken. Okay, let's come over to Monon Boulevard. It's such a nice place to ride. I pass through here almost every time I'm going somewhere. It's pretty chilly out this morning, so there's basically nobody here, except for that family. That's nice. In the warmer temperatures, this little playground right here is full of people and families and parents. And then people hanging out right here with their laptops or their phones, doing work or just lounging. Okay, we're coming up on Midtown Plaza. Looks like we got some live music going on. I'll turn the camera on them and we'll take a look. Cool, huh? Except for that truck parked in the bike lane and all these trees hanging down really low. <laughs> It's so normal whenever I'm getting ready to start shooting these things, I think I need to be prepared and be in the right mood to come out here and present. And I always think, okay, I'm gonna wake up ready to go. I never am. There's no prep in this. I'm never ready to do it. <laughs> but here we are anyway. I 
All right, we're gonna be getting off the fancy area. <clears throat> this is my most hated crossing. This major Monon Boulevard, how it crosses Main Street. And generally, especially of an evening and on weekends, that's an absolute traffic sewer. There's tons of people doing the grateful wave or the grateful jog as they go across in front of the motor. It's like, oops, sorry, and then they jog. Kills me inside. I hope you're noticing the trees up behind me. It's fall, leaves are changing, it's beautiful. It really makes me thankful that this infrastructure is here and is part of my commute to get places. Let's stop here and pull up another Twitter question. Adrian? You said you can get around your city via the Greenway recreational paths. My experience is more akin to Shifter's analysis. Shifter on YouTube has a great channel and you should go check it out and subscribe. I, I enjoy watching his videos a lot. My experience is more akin to Shifter's analysis. Recreational paths don't get you to commercial premises, go sort of no, nowhere. Is that different in your city? Surprisingly here, not so much. This path that we're on right now, Monon Boulevard, is a rails to trails. Uh, so this used to be the Monon Railroad. So this rails to trails will take you all the way into Indianapolis, which is about an hour bike ride that way, I think. And then you can also go maybe another hour north through a couple more towns or cities, however you want to define them. The nice thing about the Monon is that they've installed multi-use paths at a lot of the crossings you come to. So if we go up to the next road, there'll be paved multi-use paths that go that way that can help you get to your commercial destination or you know a private residence. There's a lot of those. Uh, now there are a lot of places with, say, crappy sidewalks, but I find that I encounter those less than I do the multi-use paths. And maybe we'll explore some very slightly as we keep going north here. Let's just keep riding a little bit more and see what we see. If you want to get a nice little view of the trees, these are still pretty green. It, it varies along the trail. There's some places that have really went orange and red, but this area is a little bit behind. Let's get off the trail whenever we encounter some things just to show connections. Look at that useless bike rack. Holy crap. So here is a side chute that'll take you into apartments, as you can see over here. So that's pretty handy if you live out here. This is very much a car-like community, in my opinion, uh, if you choose to do so. This takes us out here to, these look like townhouses, I guess. Whoop. But then onto a crap sidewalk rather than just taking us straight into the street. So you can imagine if you lived here, you could bike for pretty much everything. <clears throat> Leave your house, transit this bad little connection, <laughs> but then it gets you back to the Monon, which will take you everywhere. And it goes off there to the right as well, into more of the neighborhood. Oh, man. Let's stop and do a question at this little sitting area right next to the trail. And we're gonna go to our video question submission today by Natalia Barber and her husband as well, as far as I know. I'm pretty sure he was part of this question. Hello, Natalia Barber. And I have a question for you. What is the most essential item that you have to bring with you when you're leaving the house and you go cycling? Thanks, and keep on cycling. Cheers. Thanks for the question, Natalia and husband who will remain unnamed. If I had to go with an accessory uh, that I want to promote, I know exactly what that would be. It's an accessory that we have on each and every bike uh, because it's proved so useful and it's not expensive at all. So I'll take it off the Urban Arrow here. It's the Turn Ride Pocket by Turn, T-E-R-N. Uh, it has a strap on the back, you loop through, hook it onto your stem. Now we had to lengthen the strap on this one to go on this particular Urban Arrow stem, but we didn't have to modify it for any of the other bikes, the work cycles, the turn, obviously. <clears throat> and it would go on almost any bike out there. 
uh, it's so useful. It's so easy to take off and put on. Uh, what we do is we keep cell phones in the top pocket. They need to update this bag because cell phones are getting bigger. I have the Pixel 6 Pro and you'll see here it sticks out the top. My wife doesn't have a problem. She has a smaller phone. Uh, in the next pocket, we keep things like key for a lock, chapstick, beer bottle opener, some headphones, earbuds. Oh, and American feature cards in case anybody ever needs to get a hold of me and has a question. So that is the next pocket. And then the front pocket, there's a little, little one here. Keep a garage door opener. So then as I'm riding, I can just reach down and push through there and it'll open the garage door. That is my go-to must-have accessory on each bike and we have it on each bike. I think you can get them for $20, $30 maybe. Pick one up, you won't be sorry. And then, you know, whenever you get to where you're, where you're going, pull it off and take it in. I get to the grocery store, take it in, I put it in the little, uh, little seat area there uh, on the grocery cart, <clears throat> and I have everything I need. So, Natalia, I hope that answers your question. I hope you and your husband go pick up a turn ride pocket for your current cargo bike, and then your next cargo bike, which will be electric. We've talked, I know what's happening. Uh, let's see here. Let's pull out and not get T-boned by a cyclist. Don't get mad at me about that comment. Ooh, look at these leaves. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Oh, and what do you know? Another trail closure. You know, if motors had to face this same thing, there'd be an uproar. What the fuck are you talking Man, about? You're well, let's see what the detour is like. I already know what it's like, but just acting baffled and miffed for the camera. Now, I would normally go get up on the trail there, but these guys are working on it and got it blocked, the electric company. So I will get on it here. All right, it looks like we just gotta go up a little bit, jump on another trail and head back to the Monon. And we got a street sweeper. And a bunch of car brains. Ha ha. Losers. Oh, but Brandon, you're an elitist. That cargo bike cost $8,000. My dude, your car probably costs you six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month just to have and pay for and maintain and operate. Don't call me the elitist. All right, so we've just jumped on another trail. I think this is called the Hagen Burke. Hello, squirrel. This will take us right back up to the Monon, past that construction, and we can keep going north on the Monon. I hope you're enjoying the episodes. Again, no prep goes into this. <laughs> ah, says a lot. But I still have high hopes for entertainment. <clears throat> okay, now let me show you how we get back on the Monon. There's where the construction is again. And the Monon is right here. We're back on it. So this tunnel we're going into goes under a highway. It's lit decently at night. I think it could be a little better, but it's not too, too bad. Are you having fun yet? Okay, Jared. Thoughts on the NYC proposal of bounty for reporting cars parked in the bike lanes? Question mark. I don't know the details, but I have seen some discourse about it online recently and i think it's an excellent idea so let's start with the simple fact that there's no human enforcement or sign that can possibly um, enforce motorist behavior the only way to direct behavior is through design so you have to have proper protected design and that protects people 24-7, 365 uh, on holidays, middle of the night, doesn't require overtime, and never misses a person. But as it stands right now, we don't have proper infrastructure design. Well, even whenever the police see motorists behaving badly and breaking the law and putting people's lives in danger, they do nothing about it for the most part. So we can't rely upon the police either. 
I think in this climate we're all getting to know that. Uh, yes, we should absolutely make it so that people can report these things through an app with photo or video evidence and uh, have it processed through a municipality so that there are fines levied for it. It's going to be a band-aid while we <laughs> spend the next 50 to 100 years trying to make better infrastructure design here in the United States actually happen. Uh, and even afterwards, I think it'd be a useful tool. So I very much support it. I think it should go through and I think people should be really vocal about it to help make it happen. So we're coming upon where we're going to get off and we'll get off here and go down so I can show you the path that I'd take to Whole Foods. And then we'll come back up this and go back across. So we jump off here, go down this nice little ramp There's a bike here. Interesting. And anyway, we come to this multi-use path that goes east and west, right next to a strode. So we can go that way. There's just neighborhoods that way, I think. But then we can go that way, which would get you to my Whole Foods in about 60 seconds. So 60 seconds there uh, to the grocery store, get my stuff, come back, and back on the Monon. I hate strodes. <laughs> Strode here. They're building some, uh, uh, I guess they're townhouses here. I don't know how many there's going to be. Handful. Anyway, it's going to be right next to a strode, but right next to the Monon. And the starting price is 700000 I wouldn't want to pay $700,000 to live right next to a strode, even if I was right next to a rails to trails, 700,000. Should this be the background? Or should this, the League of American Bicyclists, bicycle friendly community sign be the background? I'm gonna go with this way, all right? Talking about accessories earlier, it's now chilly out. I have this wool seat cover, okay? Easily slips on and off of your saddle. And it really makes things comfortable fall through spring. So I've got it on there. I can take a picture of all this stuff. Um, here, we'll get you in it too. I also have my pogies on to help keep, uh, keep my hands warm. And I'll put a picture up of that as well. But next, anyway, on to the next question. Uh, I've seen you park your cargo bike in car parking spots. Do you have alternate theft deterrent systems besides locking it to a rack. Normally when you see me parked in a car parking spot it's because I'm doing curbside so I'm really not leaving the bike there but I do park in car parking spots like whenever I pull up to UPS or FedEx or some other places that I just have to run inside uh, and do something very quickly or just for a few minutes. Yeah I'll park there. I kind of park out towards the back of the parking spot and a little bit at an angle. It just helps to make your bike more visible because motors come hauling ass and speeding into a parking spot. One way, you're going the wrong way down a one way here. I bet it's your bike first. Oh, no, oh and if you've just pulled way up to the front and are parked straight on, they may not see you and just plow right into your bike and suddenly it's your fault. Oh, uh, sorry to bother you. You, uh, you haven't seen a bike around here, have you? Oh, yeah, sure. It's right here under the car. Let me get it for you. The tire isn't flat, so we're in good shape. Oh. But, yeah, and if I'm going to be a few minutes, you know, I'll lock the cafe lock or maybe drape a chain lock through the rear wheel just for visual effect. We're going over that strode now. on the bridge, you see the paneling there? It really helps block a lot of the noise too. So as we go down this bridge, technically it already happened when we crossed the strode, but uh, you'll see a sign up here. Now we're going from Carmel Township to Westfield, Indiana Township. Uh, maybe you can read there, Westfield Monon. And then the sign up here also says Westfield Monon. We're now no longer in Carmel, we're now in Westfield. And surprisingly, I just like to point this out, this is a place where you can ride a bike 
from one town or one city, whatever you want to label them, to the other um, on protected infrastructure and in this beautiful setting. It's lovely, isn't it? So that's been really enabling. We've went to Westfield a few times for various things. There's a store there called Urban Farmer where I get uh, seeds for planting, flowers and stuff. Um, there's a brewery, brewer, brewer, brewery? <laughs> English is hard. Let me stop here. We got to start eliminating these Twitter questions so I can wrap up this <laughs> episode. Actually, my hands are it's warming up a little bit. It's probably like eight or nine now. So I'm gonna take the gloves off. I mentioned earlier, I wore my gloves at 15 and below, but I have these pogies on. So once I stick my hands in there, I'll be just fine. Oh, this is an important one, I think. Do you think bike insurance is worth it? What about coverage for medical and or liability if you get into a crash on the bike? Okay, so we're a car light household. We do have a car, we do have car insurance, and that would kind of cover me uh, oh, we have car insurance, home insurance, insurance of insurance and insurance and insurance. The fun shit you run into when you get older. So we'd be covered if the bike got stolen or you know, needed medical or something. But if you're just bike only, um, one of the best companies that I've heard of that you can get here in the U.S. I can't speak for other countries uh, is Velosurance. So V-E-L-O-S-U-R-A-N-C-E. So velosurance.com, <clears throat> they cover everything you mentioned in your question. You know, stolen bikes, whether it's acoustic bikes or e-bikes, cargo bikes. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's some medical and liability and other stuff in there too. So go to velosurance.com. I'm not affiliated with them at all. I'm not affiliated with anybody. Uh, and check that out because I've heard a lot of people use it. I've heard stories of people having to make insurance claims and that it went well. Um, so I think that's that's a good one to check out. So Velosurance. We're going to quick stop once again at this little area, but first let's look at it. Right off the trail, what do we got here? A fix-it station right there, I hope you can see. A little free library, that is little, little. We got a map here of the trail, and right here some bike parking with good racks. Oh, really good racks, actually. You may not be able to see it, but these are Sheffield type, staple type, but uh, the bolts are not above the concrete, the bolts are below concrete, so that's even better. Um, and this little area here has a camera up there, and it says touch screen to begin. I think you can, uh, you know, come here and get a hold of authorities if you need safety or something like that. And then over in here, it looks like people can drive, park their living room on wheels, and then, come to the trail and walk their dog or whatever they do. Kyle Robinson, perhaps you have already done this, but could you point out areas in your town that you don't like and explain how you would change them and improve them? We don't have time for that. Um, that would be like a, a, a four season, uh, 10 episode per season mini series. It's not really mini then, is it? Of me talking about bad design, the thing with Carmel is that they claim to be a city for people. They're very much a city for motorists. They do things to prioritize motorists and people driving. And then everything else, for the most part, not everything, but most things are add-ons for bikes and people walking. And add-ons aren't the same thing as purpose-driven design in a city for people. That's whenever you design for people, bikes, wheelchairs, scooters, uh, other mobility aids and then later down that line then you design for cars if they can fit in and if they need to fit in uh, but it's done in the opposite it's North America of course and they're designing for motorists so that's that uh, a lot of their designers and the people that they're talking to are just overlooking key aspects in design that you need to be doing they're just trying to view through a North American lens and there's a lot missing there it's, there's some ignorance happening. Ignorance isn't a bad word, it's just an accurate description uh, for what's going on with a lot of the design here. Okay, uh, last question. <clears throat> this is gonna go to Riley. You keep talking about wearing the right layers for the cold. What are the right layers? Good question. We do have cold here in Indiana. It's not so bad, nothing like what I experienced in Minnesota. 
<sighs> okay, so I, to I told you about the wool seat cover. Uh, I told you about the pogies. Now the pogies are the key. When I lived in Minnesota, if it weren't for pogies, I probably would have never been able to do winter cycling. I could never find a pair of gloves that would adequately take care of me. Now we have pogies by Wobs, W-O-B-S, warm on bikes. Can't buy these in the U.S., you gotta get them from Europe, mainly the Netherlands, but you can order them online. Uh, they make them for swept back bars. Now you can find pogies, uh, also called feet uh, feet feet muffin, <laughs> feet muffin for drop bars and straight bars. You can find those available here in the U.S. Pogies are super, super enabler for cold weather cycling. Seat cover's not really necessary, but it helps. And the other thing I will comment on is this Patagonia jacket. I was really on the fence for a long time about buying Patagonia because it's so expensive and I just thought, oh, it's a trend, you know, people buy these because, oh, I own Patagonia shit. I bought this in Minnesota. It's very light. It looks very thin, but I rode in the coldest temperatures. This jacket did it. It was probably three or four hundred dollars. It, it does what it says it does and it keeps me warm. Uh, as it gets colder, you can layer up a little bit better. You know, you can buy different forms of long underwear, top and bottom. Some are thicker than others. I have two pairs. I have one pair that goes on at about five Celsius down to a few degrees below zero. And then after that, I put on the thicker pair of long underwear for the cold, cold riding. Wool socks, wool socks are amazing. Um, I buy mine from some lady on Etsy who makes them out of alpaca fur, fur or wool or I don't know. As soon as it gets down to, you know, negative five, negative 10, negative 15, you're still gonna see me in what looks like just this jacket and jeans, but I have thin but appropriate layers underneath and then combined with these pogies and some gloves, hat. Once it gets colder, I have like a thinner, a thinner layer thing that kind of goes around the ring of my head and around the ears, and then this hat goes over it. And anybody who's ever given up on winter riding never made it past the per first five to seven minutes because I've rode countless winter rides to the grocery store, to everywhere, as used to it as I am, those first five to seven minutes are always having you question, did I make the right decision? <laughs> Your face is cold. You're feeling it elsewhere, but you'll get past that. And as soon as you get past that initial, you know, five to seven minutes, in my opinion, you're acclimated and then you're comfortable. And then the longer you cycle, you get warmed up just a little bit and you're fine. Uh, even in the worst winter temperatures, I've gotten to my destination sometimes a little warm and it can be freezing outside so all right check out some leaves quit looking at me quit listening to me ramble i conclude that fall is the best season autumn whatever you want to call it a little note on how this is going to go as we go into the later fall and winter i don't know how many i'm going to do uh, this winter it's Again, I keep riding, but I don't, you know, I ride for a purpose. I don't really ride just for fun. So I don't know how often I'm gonna feel like just heading out into the cold and screwing around and making an episode. But we'll see, who knows? Maybe I'll make more than anticipated, but we will have one coming up probably in the next month or so where we go check out that Carmel Christmas market. Uh, I'll try to remember to put a link to a video in the description of that Carmel Christmas Market so you can see what it looks like. If you're not far from here, come check it out. It's really cool. As the Dutch would say, it is very gazellig or gazellig. Horrible, horrible attempt at gazellig. Gazellig. Uh, all right, I give up. Anyway, Carmel Christmas Market, come check it out. It's authentic German or as authentic German as you can get on this side of the Atlantic. Also, uh, please keep an eye out on Twitter. Come join me on Twitter, please. Uh, I do reach out and ask for questions that I can address during these episodes, and I couldn't really do it without you guys. I need something to talk about. Otherwise, it's just a guy in his late 30s on his bike rambling at a camera, and I don't think anybody 
wants to hear random thoughts that come out of my head. It's already hard enough to get you guys to come over and watch a video in the first place. I see you in the analytics. I know how long you're paying attention or not. So thanks everybody for coming by and watching again. And I hope to see you back here next time. If you are feeling generous, hit the like button. If you aren't subscribed, do it. I guess I'm, I, I guess I'm delivering this wine now. Jeez. Uh, like, subscribe, share with your friends and family. Uh, you know the jargon. I do appreciate it. Hopefully one of these days I hit the threshold for monetization and I can start collecting uh, 23 cent checks from Google. I'll be making house payments before you know it. Ugly background and area to end on, but we are ending it here, guys. So thanks for coming along. I hope to see you next time. Ride safe, bye. Okay. Now the end credits are rolling. Nobody hears me talking.